I'm sorry to keep you waiting. I had a, the opportunity to speak with the family of the, the victim of this particular matter. And uh, they're wonderful people. <clears throat> um, I assume you guys have seen the criminal complaint, or if you have the affidavit. I can just go through a recitation of some of the facts in the affidavit. Um, on June 19th of this year at 8.27 p.m., North Braddock Police Department was dispatched to the corner of Jones and Baldridge Streets. 911 indicates shots fired. The area is a concern to the police for previously other crimes there, including major crimes. Six communities that surround North Braddock Borough have a mutual aid agreement, which means that when something bad happens in that community, then the other six communities will support that police department. At 829, a witness tells North Braddock police that shots are fired by a passenger in a car and fired at particular persons. 911, excuse me, 911 further describes the vehicle. Uh, the, the description of the vehicle is wrong. They describe it as a gold mercury. They also describe the direction the vehicle left the area. At 8.30, a victim, a white male, is identified. 911 indicates gunshot wound to the abdomen. Ultimately, it's determined there's a grazing wound across the stomach that may be attributable to a bullet, may be attributable, attributable to a fragment from a building. Now, these matters, obviously, evidence continues to be developed. So as more evidence is developed, the description of the vehicle becomes uh, a light gold Chevy Cruze. The scene is secured by the Allegheny County Police shortly after the incident takes place. Uh, the Allegheny County Police, by the way, handle major crimes outside the city of Pittsburgh throughout Allegheny County. The uh, victim, the person that was grazed across the stomach, is treated and released. There is video surveillance at this intersection. Um, that video is attached as an exhibit to the criminal complaint, actually to the affidavit of the criminal complaint. What it shows is the crews comes up Baldridge. There are three occupants in the car, driver, front seat passenger, uh, rear passenger side. The rear window comes down, a handgun goes out that window and opens fire on somebody at the corner. We believe we know who the target is, but the target is not identified in the, in the affidavit. The person who is shooting the weapon has a dark colored t-shirt on. The passenger in the front seat has a white t-shirt on. There is a man in North Braddock, who was across the street, he's not the intended victim. He returns fire. When they process the scene, there are nine casings that go back to a 40 millimeter handgun. That's the handgun from the car. And there are four casings from the 45. Now from the 45, he strikes the crews three times. One goes in the rear window. One goes into the trunk to the right of the uh, license plate. And the third one goes into the driver's side, or the, excuse me, the passenger side door. There are multiple strikes on a wall, which is maybe about 10 to 15 feet from where the cruise comes up Baldridge, and that's where the intended target was. 13 minutes into processing this particular crime, the crimes that, that occurred in North Braddock, a call comes in and says shots are fired in East Pittsburgh. When detectives arrive, the scene is secure. The victim, Antoine Rose, had already been transported to McKeesport Hospital. It takes approximately five minutes to get from the site in North Braddock to the site where shots are fired in East Pittsburgh. The driver of the vehicle is in custody. The passenger with the dark t-shirts in the wind. 
They have several departments that are looking for him. That person is later identified as Zaywan, I'm not pronouncing that properly, Hester. Z-A-I-J-U-A-N, Hester. He is the shooter in North Braddock. By all accounts, um, Mr. Rose never did anything in furtherance of any crimes in North Braddock. I know there's been some speculation in the meeting. Uh, yesterday, or possibly the day before, Hester was apprehended by the sheriff's fugitive team. He was, he's currently lodged at Human Center. He'll be charged with various crimes under what's, what we refer to as Act 33 under Pennsylvania law. He will, he'll come into the, uh, the adult side of the courts. Now, this is significant to the car. Even though the car was struck three times, there's no blood evidence in the car. None of the passengers were struck in North Braddock. In East Pittsburgh, there are three spent casings that are recovered. They'll go back to a nine millimeter, nine millimeter weapon. That's the weapon of uh, Michael Rossfeld. There are two witnesses that are proximate to the location of the shooting. There is a video. Uh, from talking to the family this morning, we like to get the phone. We don't have the phone right now. We have the YouTube version of that video. Um, it's significant because we want to enhance it a little bit more. The driver is extracted from the vehicle. He's on the ground. As the officer begins to put cuffs on him, the two passengers get out of the car. According to the witnesses, Rose shows his hands, turns, and runs. He is not in possession of a weapon. Neither is the, uh, the other passenger in the, in the dark t-shirt. There's another witness with a video. He's using a camera, camera phone. The video doesn't add much to the, uh, to the evidence in the case. The car was processed, and they found two weapons in the vehicle. One is a 9 millimeter weapon that was stolen. It's under the front seat towards the front of the car. The 40 caliber was also stolen. It goes back to three or four other crimes. It's under the front seat in, towards the rear. And it is the 90 caliber weapon that was used in connection with the shooting in North Braddock. The medical examiner did the autopsy and uh, submitted various reports. Antoine Rose was hit three times. He was hit in the side of the face, in the cheek. The bullet exits through the nasal cavity. He's also hit in the right elbow from the rear. That's a through and through wound. He's hit in the mid back and that slug was recovered in his chest. That's the fatal shot. As I said before, those not, that nine millimeter slug matches Rossfeld's service weapon. The at scene Facebook posting is consistent with the independent witnesses' statements. And as I said before, there's no weapon that would have created a, a risk to Officer Rossfeld. Based on that evidence, I find that Rossfeld's actions were intentional. And they certainly brought about the result that he was, look, he was looking to accomplish. He was not acting to prevent death or serious bodily injury. It's my position that he is not entitled to a justification charge to a jury as a defense, in as much as under Pennsylvania law, if you are effectuating an arrest, you have to show the person to be arrested has committed a forcible felony. As I said already, Antoine Rose didn't do anything in North Braddock other than be in that vehicle. And you have to possess a weapon. Neither of those young men were in possession of a weapon. Or you have to otherwise indicate 
that somebody is in a position to take human life, and that is not the case here. Now these are based upon jury instructions in a Superior Court case out of Philadelphia. Uh, an appeal was taken to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, which was denied. Now this is the third time that we've had this factual scenario during my tenure. The first two date to the beginning, the beginning of my tenure. Um, you're aware that I directed that uh, one count of criminal homicide be filed in connection with this case as it was in the prior two, given the same scenarios. Uh, I credit our chiefs of police and the ladies and gentlemen of law enforcement for getting it. So for instance, last year alone, we had 1.2 million, in excess of 1.2 million calls to law enforcement. And we looked into two matters which involved police use of deadly force. That's still too, too many, but just to give you the numbers. With that being said, I'll take questions. <clears throat> No. What's my con? Pardon me? Drive as best we can tell. He's a uh, like a, a Uber driver, Jitney. Um, he's very forthcoming. Of course, he's looking at you know driving somebody to the scene of a, a shooting has criminal implications. So he was he was very forthcoming with the county police. Can you say more about uh, the exact charges and when we'll learn them? Uh, I know there's a series of possibilities. Is that something that's going to be determined by a jury? Will the charges be narrowed? And what are the potential penalties attached? The charges against the officer? Yes. Uh, one kind of criminal homicide. The evidence supports third degree murder. There's no doubt about that in my mind. Manslaughter, voluntary manslaughter, involuntary manslaughter. But we think we should have the right to argue uh, murder in the first degree. And what would be the penalty For first degree murder? That's life. Third degree is 20 to 40 years. Manslaughter is three and a half to seven. Steve, Steve can you break down why you think a third degree murder would be murder? It's an intentional act, and it's done recklessly. And there is no justification for it. DA Roosevelt, Officer Roosevelt in the affidavit says that he believed that uh, Antoine Rose had the intent to that, sir. Uh, his, we took a statement from Rossfeld. He's on audio and video. He indicates that at no time was there a weapon in play. DA. Yes, sir. Did you feel pressure to charge in this case? No, sir. I've been in, I've been doing this for a long time. The community protests, the outrage from the family. You felt no pressure at all to charge. No, I did not. As I said, this is the third time we've had this this particular fact scenario during my tenure. Charged the first two times. We're charging this time. How would you describe the actions of Officer Rossville that night? I think I just did. Steve, did Antoine Rose fire a gun at all that night? Pardon me? Do you believe Antoine Rose fired a gun at all that night? No, he did not. Are you, are you aware of any, any history of this sort of incident uh, in Officer Rossville's past? And what, if anything, can you share or have you learned about the circumstances of his departure from his previous job at the University of Pittsburgh or any other? The county police has all his personnel files. And I don't want to get into that today, but we're aware of his background. The criminal complaint against the officer uh, refers to his initial reference to seeing something in a hand, and then he makes a different statement later. The uh, complaint describes that as inconsistency. Can you explain the differences between what he said and what he used? Well, he specific, specifically says that he didn't see a weapon. It said, That's significant. In the, in the statement, though, he said that he yeah, that's that. That's inconsistent with the witness statements. It's inconsistent with the YouTube video. Does he need to see a gun or just something he believes is a gun? The jury instruction says there has to be a deadly weapon. Did Officer Rossfeld express that he was afraid at the time of the shooting, and if so, why didn't he fire a cutter? I don't know that. I know he was remorseful. Yeah, one involved the city of Pittsburgh police officer on 2nd Avenue, and one involved a housing authority police officer in the Armstrong Tunnels. 
both times, all three times, somebody was shot in the back, and they were not a threat to the to the police officer who was engaged in whatever aspect of uh, their job. Was Officer Russell on a taser as well? Did he taser? I can only tell you that Antoine was about 15 yards before he collapsed. So he starts on the passenger side of a relatively small vehicle, but I doubt that a taser could have been used. Steve, can you talk about the previous shooting in North Braddock and what impact that would have had on shooting in East Pittsburgh on Officer Roscoe when he does stop a car involved in it, he suspects it was involved in that felony shooting just 13 minutes earlier? Does he go in with apprehension then? I mean, can you address that? Well, I think you got to go. The whole situation? Sure. I I mean, did that affect the decision to charge him or not? I think you got to go in with apprehension. Yeah. But unless you see a genuine threat, then it's inappropriate to take, in fact, criminal to take somebody's life. And that's the, that's the reason you brought the charge? Primarily, yes. Was the foot chase an option, did he say, or is there any evidence that he attempted a foot chase? Well, their training, their training says you disable the vehicle first, which he did. Take the driver out, keys out, show me your hands, that type of thing. Um, you got three guys in the car. You wait for backup. So he's taking three guys out of the car before backup gets there. Can you talk about the inconsistencies that are noted at the end of the complaint in Roscoe's telling of the version of events? I'm sorry, I don't follow you. Uh, at the end of the criminal complaint, the detectives know that he told two different versions of events. Slight inconsistencies. Can you talk any more about that? Actually, I believe it's three. The object, the lack of a gun, then he goes back to an object in his hand. That's a jury question. Yeah. DA, what's your message to Antoine's family? We had a we had a very nice conversation. They're they're very decent people. Obviously, they're they're very distraught about the loss of their son, who by all indications is, is a good kid. Um, I'm going to keep that private between us, but uh, it was it, it was a good conversation. And to the community, you, you can't take somebody's life under these circumstances. Steve, you said previously that Antoine Rose had. Yes. Do you know the genesis of that? Yeah, we're speculating. The gun was stolen. He, the clip is what the original clip was for the 9mm. They changed that out for an extended clip. So instead of 9 shots, you have 17. They changed out to the other gun? No. There's a longer clip for the 9mm. So instead of 9 shots, I think it's 17. So are you indicating the tester fired the shots from that gun and then switched clips? No, there's two, <clears throat> there's two guns in the car. There's a 40 and a 9. Okay. Both guns are stolen. The 9's under the front seat. The 9 is never discharged. The 40 is discharged, and it's from the rear seat. And you guys are going to get the video feeds from bo both North Braddock, and you've, you've probably already seen the, the, the feeds on YouTube. But uh, clearly, the person whose arm is out the window with gun extended has a black T-shirt on and other, there's other evidence too that indicates that Hester's the shooter. So where did this empty clip It was already in the. It was in the weapon. Yes. You take yeah. You take the clip out because it's only nine shots. You take an extended clip and you put it in at 17. It's a trend. So it was never discharged. It's not an empty. The nine millimeter was never discharged. That's correct. I don't know if he said that in his interview or not. And also, did you, you stated that he took the people out of the car, that the procedure is to stop the, the, the safety vehicle, but you seem to indicate that he could have just waited for backup rather than trying to do the things he did. Norm you saying he went against uh, protocol or against training? Normally you wait for backup, yes, when you have multiple persons in the vehicle. You said that uh, you could have, uh, you have evidence charging at least third degree murder and then voluntary and voluntary manslaughter, but you made a decision to go with uh, first degree murder. Yeah, usually we charge criminal homicide, just one count, generally. That goes back to when we had a coroner instead of a medical examiner, because we were getting pretty bad decisions out of the coroner's office. So to clarify, you charged a general charge of homicide, which has 
as Mike explained before, you're going to the range of possibilities yes. from first to third. Yes. Just to clarify your remarks earlier, which you said clearly that there's evidence for a third, are you saying that that's what you would pursue a trial? Are you saying the evidence at minimum shows that, but you will prosecute seeking uh, uh, first degree? We're going to, right now, we would ask a jury to consider all degrees of homicide. So, which narrowing it, it will be in the hands of the jury. Not, you'll leave that to the jury should it come to trial. Right. And that's why we do that, because the coroner was making the determination and not a juror. Jury. You did say that you believe you have the right to argue for first degree. Yes, ma'am. We objected to it, yes. Well, you have an officer in the, in the county jail otherwise. I'm not sure safety considerations, security considerations, that type of thing. We objected, and we've taken that matter under advisement. I haven't made a decision what I want to do yet. Do you think this is true when we talk about lessons learned? We talk about training. Does there need to be more training? Is there, do you have any thoughts on, on what needs to happen in the law? Yeah. We have, in Allegheny County, we have the Allegheny County Chiefs of Police Association, which is a really progressive professional group of uh, uh, law enforcement members. Um, those guys come out with model policies. They, they can't obligate individual police departments to follow those policies. So in this case, yeah, I am concerned of the lack of policies and procedures in East Pittsburgh. And East Pittsburgh, by the way, is not the city of Pittsburgh. It's a separate municipality towards the uh, eastern part of the county. Um, we have 118 police departments, some, some of which are run very well, some of which we have to keep an eye on all the time, but that's a creature of the legislature. If the legislature wants to do something about it, we're all here today. Let's tell them to do it. Steve, was there gunshot residue found on Hester's hands, and was there gunshot residue found on Rose's hands? Tests are pending. You don't know? At this point, we do not know. Probably there is not going to be residue because the gun was far enough out the window that it wouldn't have blown back. Hester. On Hester. But clearly Hester's the shooter. Did you test Rose too? Yes. Those are pending. Those are pending. So you go back into the law, can you talk about the idea of an officer a fleeing felon and whether or not that can be justification for an officer shooting somebody who may have just previously been involved in a potentially serious felon? Yeah, under 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 the arrest scenario, generally speaking, an officer has to be in fear of, of death or serious bodily injury. Then you could return that threat with, the, with, with appropriate force. If you're trying to effectuate an arrest, then what you have to show is several things. You have to show that there was a forcible felony. Okay, shooting at somebody in North Braddock could be considered a forcible felony, but it was committed by Rose. It was not committed, excuse me, it was committed by Hester, not by, not by Antoine. You also, but you also have to show that a weapon's involved or that you are otherwise in serious, you know, there's the possibility of serious bodily injury. Those elements clearly are not there. Steve, talking about the, the gun, you said Antoine Rose did not fire a gun, but him being in the car at that drive-by shooting, does that make him a party to the crime? No. But the driver is a party to the crime? The driver could, could be. How, what is the difference there? Well, we need him as a witness. Do you know how Antoine Rose happened to be in that car or what led up to his decision to be involved in this? Was he we have, a, we have an idea of motive, but I can't comment on motive, yes. Do you have any concerns, or can you talk about any concerns you have about East Pittsburgh's um, policies and procedures or lack of East Pittsburgh police? Yeah, I'm going to take that up with the U.S. Attorney. And do you know for a fact that Antoine Rose did know uh, Hester, they were not Hester, they were acquaintances? Are you clear on that? Yes, they knew each other. Steve, regarding those policies, are you saying that they did not have uh, well-defined policies about how to conduct that traffic stop? In, in response to questions by the major crime investigators, when they first came on scene in East Pittsburgh, they said, well, how do you handle these situations? What's your policy? And they said, we don't have policies. That's, that's a very dangerous situation. Why was that they don't have policies for what? They don't have policies for what? East Pittsburgh For anything, as far as we know. We've been in touch with the FBI, yes. Did Rossfeld get his training? Uh, primarily with the University of Pittsburgh. He was 10 years with those guys. This isn't like his first stop. Can you talk some more about the danger of not having a policy for 
<laughs> Somebody's dead. Can there be any more dangerous situation? Does that make East Pittsburgh responsible in any way? I'm sorry? Does that make East Pittsburgh responsible in any way? <laughs> Criminally? No. Civilly? They're going to they get a lot of answering to do. On the matter of not challenging uh, what you uh, we objected to it. We objected to the, the bond that was issued. Going forward, are you likely or do you expect within the next week or so to bring that matter before uh, an Allegheny County shot? Uh, yeah, the way, the way bond works in Allegheny County is initially, it's, it's a judicial function. So initially what you do is, if you, if you hit the county jail, then you go in front of a, an arraigning magistrate. The intake people are there, the bail agencies there, and the public defender's office is there. We don't participate in those types of matters. Um, by constitution, if you charge generally homicide, then you shouldn't be able to be bailed. And the magistrate set the bail at $250,000 unsecured. So that's a matter that I'll, I'll talk to Judge Manning because he hears, he hears appeals from bond issues. So uh, do you, can you say, just to clarify, do you intend to pursue that? Are you ruling out pursuing that? Well, I'll talk to my team and see if that affects how we're going to try the case the and make a decision. The processing here took about an hour. Generally, it takes you know, eight to ten hours. So there's special treatment at the jail? No, this is being handled just like any other homicide. Why was Hester firing out of the back of the car? We, ha we have an idea of that, but it deals with motive. And I can't comment. I'm not permitted to comment under the rules of professional conduct. Can you talk about the protests at all? What's your reaction to what's been happening in your county? I'm taking care of business. <laughs> we, I don't mean we, whether, you're, whether you feel pressured. I mean just in general. The blocking of the streets, the protests happening. Uh, I don't know that I really do have an opinion. I mean, I mean, the people own the criminal justice system, and if they've got issues with it, I think they have the right to express that. Not it's not a blanket ruling. The, uh, as I said before, the Superior Court addressed this in the mid-90s in terms of the jury instruction. That was appealed to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, which was denied. It was heard on a collateral appeal in the federal courts in Philadelphia who upheld the Superior Court's determination. Do you believe that should be the standard? It is the standard. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that I've just told you the circumstances under which it is appropriate to use deadly force if you're effectuating an arrest. Steve, do you think uh, Antoine Rose was just in, in the wrong place at the wrong time? Does it matter the circumstances? I really can't. I can't speak to that. I mean, he's in a car, but he didn't do anything in furtherance of, if you want to call it a conspiracy, he didn't do, do anything in furtherance of that. Given the clip in his pocket, You infer that he was in possession of a stolen weapon based on, on that? You can infer that, yes. There's, a, there's other evidence, but that's really of no moment when we're talking about a homicide. So it's not relevant to uh, uh, the officer's actions or his status, uh, Rose's own uh, status in that instance? The possession of an empty clip? No. It doesn't have anything to do with the thought, thought processes. I'm not going to get into personnel issues. I mean, that may be relevant at the time of trial. Again, I'm, I'm talking to you guys from the substance of an affidavit that supports a criminal complaint, so that I'm limited to discussing the issues that are in the affidavit. Rose's attorney has said that there are some, some previous instances where Rockwell uh, was not allowed to have a firearm in We, we have his entire personnel file. Um, chief Loftus, who formerly, who's the, the chief of the Pittsburgh, University of Pittsburgh Police, was formerly the chief of Miami Metro. So he, he knows what he's doing. And we talked to him at length. Are you going to release the personnel file? 
Pardon me? Are you going to release the person on file? It's not part of the prosecution. What you saw uh, about his prior uh, behavior as an officer, did that give you concern? Yes. Did he, he make false statements against suspects in uh, the garage door? I'm not going to get into details. Um, can you talk about the uh, eyewitness accounts of um, him showing his hands as he ran away in one row? Uh, yeah, we have a witness specifically who says his hands go up and he turns immediately and runs. There's and both witnesses that are right there. Your cars park, say it's parked in front of me, the next house over and the next house, the next house over, they're, they're witnesses. And this, is, and this is after he exits the car? Yes, exits, turns, books. Did you hear that he was showing his hands in an effort to show the officer he was unarmed? That's what the witnesses say. That's what the video from YouTube indicates. Now we'd like to enhance that, but um, we're not at that point yet. I want to say that was three days ago. County police, or was it was it at Tomassi's? <laughs> Penn Hills Police Department. It's on audio and video. I don't know that. I can I can get that for you. Well, it's the same thing that I indicated earlier when I first came into office. You, taking human life is the most important, it's one of the most important things in this community, dealing with those types of tragedies. You do not shoot somebody in the back if they are not a threat to you. How long do you have to make that decision? How many seconds was it from the time you pulled the vehicle over to a shot and from I don't know exactly the number of seconds, but it was very quickly. Can you go back to the police training? Uh, yes, sir. Across, across the board uh, around Allegheny County, officers usually only have one time a year they do shoot, don't shoot training. Do you think that it should be increased? Well, most of the guys that are in these small towns, they train to minimum standards. It's called Act 120. Um, yeah, you have, to, you have to have a refresher every year. You have to discharge, you know, fire a weapon. Um, our, our community, are you from Allegheny County? Okay, so in the North Hills, you face a different type of threat and a different type of crime than you do in the Mon Valley, or that you may do in the periphery of the city of Pittsburgh. So yeah, the guys who handle major crimes on a regular basis, they usually use the county police, but uh, if, you, if you're going to get in a fire, you firefight, you know, you've you got to be trained properly. So it's kind of a constant battle, but as I said before, the chiefs of police in our county, they're very progressive and, and uh, um, I think they're, they're a great agency. Uh, in terms of video of this, you had uh, indicated uh, a municipal video, uh, uh, a bus video. Can you recount, is there a video that is yet in hand, in some authorities' hand, but yet to be viewed? Uh, what video will you be able to release after this news conference today, and what do you anticipate would it actually be shown at the preliminary hearing? At that intersection in North Braddock, there are actually three cameras. And what we did is we had the techs at the, the county police put them together so you can see the car come up Baldridge, turn, start, begin to turn left onto Jones, even before they start to make the turn. The gun goes, the hand goes out, gun, go, you know, gun goes out the window, shots are discharged. You're gonna, you can have that, that's an exhibit. You can have, just ask Mike, it's been redacted. The unredacted version will go into evidence at the preliminary hearing or whenever the whenever the courts first convene on this matter. Do you know uh, during the Act 120 training, at least in Allegheny County, uh, are officers put through a scenario in the fast machine of a clean felon? Do you know if that's one of the scenarios or sims in the fast? I believe it is. Okay. I believe it is. Do you anticipate that, just to clarify, the fire? Oh, I'm sorry. You asked me about the uh, bus bus video. We just received video from that particular bus. A bus goes through that intersection just before shots are fired. Our buses normally have six cameras, so we haven't we haven't had a chance to look at that yet. But it's it, it could it could help us. But we know we know who the I said several times. We know who the shooter from the car is. We know who the the guy is that returned fire on the street. We're looking for him now too. Uh, 
video uh, with this, the video interview of the officer in which he makes his statements. No, the detective would testify as to what he said in the interview. Hey guys, we're going to wrap this up. See, One more question. Did he start cooperating in the investigation into Officer Rosso? No, not at this point. All right, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I appreciate it. Thank you.